Madagascar. And that led to an exhibition in London, New York, and then in Madagascar. This sort of cooperative training program, mutually educational, educational for both sides, has also involved museum staff in Uganda, Kenya, as I mentioned, Nigeria, Ghana, and Tanzania. The basic procedure is for staff from the British Museum and African Museums to work together in workshops. These usually last two weeks, three weeks. In order to transfer specific expertise both ways, for example, in the conservation and mounting of textiles, and this often results in a new exhibition at the host museum. This has created a skilled body of curators across Africa who can not only work within, the, within their own countries, but join together on joint projects across borders. Many of the African museum staff who took part in these workshops have also been offered internships in the British Museum in London, where they can not only learn in the British Museum, but go and visit other museums which are relevant to their subject. There have been several Ghanaians who've done this. One is Mr. Emmanuel Quenu at the Military Museum at the fort. Another is Mr. Gordon Prim Primpong of Manchia Palace Museum, who's done an enormous amount to improve the storage there and the facilities at the sword site. And then there is Miss Patricia Ammo of the Prempe II Jubilee Museum. These are typical graduates of that system. In addition, some of the people who've been involved in it have stayed in Britain for a longer period and gone on to take higher degrees at English universities. Another project that the group did was to revive the exhibitions at Cape Coast Castle Museum. When those exhibitions were set up in 1994, it was proposed that they would be renewed every two years. It didn't happen. So by 2008, they were in a poor state. People from the British Museum, from National Museum of National Museum Accra, from Mancha Palace and other museums here, worked together with the archaeology department of Legon and completely refurbished those exhibitions in a short time. Another British Museum cooperative project was to teach how bronzes and brass material could be safely packed and transferred. And this allowed the Oni of Ife to lend many Ife bronzes to the British Museum for an exhibition in 2010 which was attended by 55,000 people. Other museums have similar projects. The Museum for Volkerkunde in Vienna has been doing research on a particular sort of Nigerian textile, and that led to a joint exhibition in Lagos and in Vienna. This is a start. It's a start that's often been overlooked, ignored by museum specialists in many countries, but it is a good start. I don't think it is any longer enough. I think we are moving into a new stage, and I think it is time for African museums to take an initiative and to ask for formal genuine partnerships with major overseas museums. And it is for African museums to set out what they want and what they expect from that partnership. Let me sketch what the partnership would involve. First, if it is to work, it must be approached in terms of equality. The European or French museums may have vastly more resources, but they lack detailed knowledge an understanding of the situation here. For cooperation to work, they must have a willingness to listen to Africans and to participate and to, trans and to treat their African colleagues as equals. 
Secondly, I suggest there should be a regular transfer of people between the two institutions in these partnerships. Expatriates should come to Africa and work with host museums so they can develop their own skills and understanding. I believe these sorts of staff exchange should not go on just for a matter of weeks or months, but for much longer periods. Possibly they should lead to joint research programs and exhibitions. In short, I am suggesting a twinning between African and overseas museums. Restitution is important, but it is only an element in these relationships. Of course, there are formidable difficulties in the way. Money, of course, is a key program, problem to any program. Even the grandest world museums always complain they don't have enough money. This is true, but I think overseas museums must begin to train, change their approach. They should start to include budgets for cooperative developments with overseas museums. Isolationism is no longer enough, nor is it a viable strategy in a changing world. The more isolated museums keep themselves, the more easily they can be attacked. Now is the time to begin to create real alliances. I profoundly hope this will happen. But I think we also need to consider other potential changes that may affect museums and how they operate. I'm thinking particularly of new technologies. The first technology is 3D printing. In essence, the process is simple, as you will know. An object is scanned, the results are fed into a computer, and the program controls the way that layer of la and layer after layer of material is deposited to build up a replica of the object. Sometimes no scanning is needed, you simply feed a program into the 3D printer. 3D printing is already being widely used in industry. They're even building houses with 3D printers. The technology is developing very rapidly. And in a very short time, it will be possible for museums to create extremely accurate replicas of everything in their museum. If they want, they could turn out unlimited numbers of these objects, of these replicas. The only limit would be on the cost of the material and the machinery. But it would not stop there. It would be possible for anyone, almost anywhere, to reproduce a particular museum object. If the software program to program the printer was available over the web, then anyone who had the printing technology would be able to produce copies. So if you want a perfect facsimile of a Benin plaque, you get hold of a printer, rent or buy the software program, and you can churn out as many as you want. The question is, what sort of effect would this have on museums? Will copies begin to play an important part in their activities? Of course, replicas are always inferior to the originals. An original will, original will always have the potential to allow us to discover more about it. Nowadays, museums are rather disdainful of replicas. But it was not always the case. In the 19th century, most museums obtained replicas, particularly of classical sculpture and monuments. The Victorian Albert Museum in London has a whole gallery devoted to early replicas, 19th century replicas. And you can actually see classical sculpture 
but you get a sense of how the Victorians also regarded replicas and the history of the museum itself. Replicas were also used for research purposes. The British Museum has marvelous plaster replicas of the great Maya monuments of Central America, dating from 6th, 8th centuries AD. Uh, they couldn't be brought to Europe, the originals, so people took presses, molds from them, and recon sorry about that, um, and reconstituted the monuments when they got back to Europe. They were a major research problem project. Um, until recently, many museums produced high-quality replicas. When the National Museum of Ghana was being created, the British Museum sent to it three plaster replicas of major carvings from Central Africa. And they were beautifully colored, colored and painted to look like the original, and they're still in Accra. So if we accept that 3D printing is going to improve rapidly, it will soon be possible to produce almost any, anywhere high quality replicas of museum specimens. Now we have to consider what effect that might have. Will it allow people to build their own museums, put on their own exhibitions? Will it give people access to objects that they could otherwise never see? I think there are great changes coming from that. There's another technology which may have a profound effect. This is virtual reality. <coughs> virtual reality, you know, thank you. Virtual reality, you know, works by a person wearing a headset which presents to his or her eyes images and sounds that the brain sees in a way that makes them seem real. So with a, vi a virtual reality headset, you can imagine you're driving a car or flying a plane or swimming underwater. By wearing special gloves or th things attached to other parts of your body, you can get the sensation of touching these things, manipulating them, moving them around. Eventually, we'll probably have implants in our heads so we don't have to wear the kit. Now, this technology is improving rapidly, and it will soon become possible to reach a point where it is almost impossible, or totally impossible, to distinguish between what I might call real reality and virtual reality. Now, imagine this being used in a museum. You could scan an object from every angle turn it into a virtual reality program, and then by wearing a headset, a person could imagine they were touching that object, manipulating it, lifting it, turning it around, examining it from every angle. You go to a museum, you can't do that. There's a thing in the case. You can only see it from the front, and the lights are probably faulty anyway, so you can't see it very well at all. Virtual reality would change all that. It will give people a sort of access to museum specimens in ways that they could never otherwise have had. Of course, all museums lack the money and the technical skills to turn their objects into programs for 3D printing or virtual reality experiences. Of course, the technology will get cheaper and easier to use. But looking at in a wider perspective, museums may not need to do this work at all themselves. Some of the great IT firms like Google or Amazon will get involved. They may offer to produce virtual reality images and software programs for 3D printing 
on a basis that they sell these, market these, and the museums will get a share of the percentage profit, much as they market uh, electronic books at the moment. Of course, there'll be copyright problems, and if you're a lawyer, you will be able to make a lot of money arguing over who has the copyright in these reproductions. So if you're a young lawyer, I recommend this as a field that will keep you going for many years. But suppose this happens, what effect will it have on museums? Will they, for example, cease to be places where people actually go, but instead they become centers from which information is electronically spread around the world and allow the creation of almost perfect replicas? Will it help end the gap between rich and less rich museums? If an original is reduced to an electronic program, will that be a sort of liberation? Could the original thing be returned to wherever it came from? So once again, perhaps, it could be used in rituals and ceremonies. Would the unique qualities of an object and their physical location become something of less importance? Will knowledge and sensation overcome the importance of ownership. There is another, a third technological advice, advance that interests me, which is artificial intelligence, where you can teach machines to examine things, to learn things, to study them in the way that a human could do, but they become more and more powerful than humans. In this way, virtual reality could feed into an artificial intelligence program. So if you wanted to do research on a particular object all over the world, you would no longer want to go there, examine each piece, but you could set a machine to answer the questions you raise and probably to propose other questions you hadn't even thought of. So. All I'm suggesting is there are potentials for very profound changes in the way that museums operate. Does this matter? In one sense it does, because it would change museums from places where people go to look at objects behind glass cases or in the open to places that supply knowledge in entirely new ways. In the end, however, I think whatever the answers that come out of these changes, and I think they will come, I think they will come, whatever the changes that come out of these operations, museums will begin to cooperate more, I think, Knowledge would be spread more. But I think, in the end, we have to remember museums are there to enrich people's lives. The way they do this may change, but the basic mission must continue. And that is why I have great faith in the future of museums. Thank you very much. A louder round of applause for Professor McLeod. <laughs> Having delivered the last lecture of the 11th RP Bafo lecture, um, it is deemed to have officially come to an end, but in the course of the program, our speaker will be duly honored by the university. At this point, council will recess and uh, prepare for the 2019 Founders Day corrugation. Shall we please rise for the recession of council? <laughs>